Fantastic. So we'll go ahead and get started with our um, webinar today. So I'd like to say hello and welcome to everyone that's joining us. I know uh, more people will probably join as we get started. So I'm so happy and excited to be sharing this space with you all. And I'd like to take this time to recognize those we have lost to suicide and honor their memories as we learn from their experiences and move forward with strength and courage for a hopeful and happy future for all of our communities. So um, thank you for um, taking that moment with me to recognize those that we use, you know, the data from um, people, they're real people um, that have gone through these issues. So it's really important to recognize um, that we're learning from them. Okay, um, Frank, can you go ahead and put up the PowerPoint slide, please? Okay, I'll go ahead and share my screen, Frank if that works better. All right, I'll go ahead and um, what we're, what's going on here, Frank? So welcome to our webinar, Suicide Surveillance, Challenges and Strategies in American Indian and Alaska Native Communities. And my name is Doreen Bird. I'm from Kiwa Pueblo, also known as Santa Domingo Pueblo, New Mexico. And I've been the lead researcher in this study. I also like to recognize Melissa Adolphson, who is a co-investigator, um, did a lot of the data analysis and helped co-write this report up with me. And also, we um, are having some issues here. I'm sorry about this. Uh, we have Lauren Lockhart from the American Indian um, Health and Family Services out of Michigan. So I'm so excited to be sharing the results of our study with you. We have a funding disclaimer. The Suicide Prevention Resource Center is at EDC, and it's supported by a grant from the United States Department of Health and Human Services and Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and also the Center for Mental Health Services. So the views and opinions and content expressed in this presentation do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions or policies of those agencies. And there's our picture. And um, Lynn Lockhart is my co-presenter today. I'm going uh, going ahead and accepting um, for Frank to go ahead and take over controlling the slides here for us. All right, there we go. So we can go ahead and move forward to the next slide, Frank. I'll introduce Lauren when we get to her part. So at this time, I'd like to take a moment and review some of the history of research with American Indian Alaska Natives in the U.S. This is important because, um, you know, not everybody knows all uh, what has taken place um, in our history, um, starting back from 1820, um, Secretary of War John C. C. Calhoun had a report to Congress on the missionary work with American Indians. And so if you could imagine, way back then, um, the data was starting to be collected and shared with the United States government. And like 100 years after that, in 1927, the U.S. Department of Interior 
Office of Indian Affairs also was reporting back. And they're having this debate of whether um, the Native Americans or American Indians um, were wards of the government or were they nations in their own right. So that was the debate going on in that time frame. And then moving forward to 1944, I found some studies in, of Old Oribe, that's um, a Hopi reservation in the southwest United States, where they were um, doing studies of a, a you know, tribe. So that was really interesting for me. One of the earlier studies I um, reviewed in a American Indian and Alaska Native Suicide talks about in the Hopi reservation, they were um, really having to deal with the issue of the clan system and how some of the tribal members would actually fall in love with people from the same clan, and which was a taboo and very much prohibited. And so back then, they were already studying that, that those kind of relationship issues were leading um, to suicides in that reservation. In 1979, um, the Center for Research on Acts of Men they did, the, did that study on Barrow, Alaska, and that was an alcohol study. But unfortunately, the results, the way they were disseminated and um, published, they stigmatized the entire community. And um, they were labeled as you know, the drunken Indian stereotype, where actually the data was gathered from just a, a portion of the community members. And so um, it wasn't reported as accurately um, as it could have been, and unfortunately, it stigmatized that whole community. We move forward to the Havasupai um, diabetes study at Arizona State University. That um, is a recent occurrence where um, data or samples, blood samples, were used again um, for another study that which they hadn't received consent form uh, uh, for, and so that really affected the community. Um, it brought forth some social justice issues and Native Americans kind of taking ownership of their research. And so currently, that's what's happening now is the community-based participatory research approach is widely accepted and supported. And this study that we're going to be talking about today does include um, American Indian, Alaska Native community members um, in the research that we're doing and also in the staff of the work that we're doing. So we're very much taking a current approach to our study. OK, you can go ahead and I'll move to the next slide. So the reason why we're doing this study oh, is that Garrett Lee Smith um, state and tribal grants uh, require demonstration of the impact in reducing suicide deaths and attempts. So when the federal funding um, requirements come down, um, to the communities that are doing the work, they're actually asked to prove that um, the work that they're doing is reducing suicide deaths. And so we want to be able to support these communities and look into some of the um, strengths and challenges of doing this work. So some of the tribal grantees encounter data collection challenges. And so they need um, effective strategies to use. And it's nice to see what other grantees are doing and being able to learn from each other's experiences. And also, the results from the, the study will help us in providing better technical assistance. So the Suicide Prevention Resource Center is tasked to provide training and technical assistance to the Garrett Lee Smith grantees. And some of this data helps us to um, work better with the communities in a culturally sensitive way. And so we, hopefully with all this, we're going to gather some strategies to incorporate um, cultural sensitivity and awareness into the suicide data collection work that we all are tasked to do. A quick um, run through of the methods. We did a literature review and an environmental scan for this study. And we um, looked at a lot of the monthly meeting notes that our grantees have with their government project officers and talking about you know, what are the challenges they go through and how do they address them. Um, some of the meeting notes were really helpful to see the exact um, on the ground work that was going on. We also did key informant interviews with 22 sites. And um, some of those were tribal epidemiology centers, researchers, and health professionals that are doing suicide prevention work. 
And we also did a survey of all 17 tribal Garrett Lee Smith grantees. And this was last year when we had 17 um, and 100% of them responded. It was so awesome that we got such a great response from our grantees. And we analyzed the results. And this is our way of sharing it back with the grantees with prevention specialists, the public, um, and SAMHSA. And this will be recorded, and it'll be archived on the sprc.org website. So some of the types of primary data that our grantees collect, um, you can see suicide deaths, suicide attempts. Most of them are collecting um, deaths and attempts. There is some of them collecting um, if their participants have made suicide plans suicide ideation, and, and that's when people are thinking of taking their own lives. And like about 80% of our grantees are collecting um, data on that. Interestingly, 86% uh, are collecting data on mental health. And so they're seeing that there's a connection between mental health and um, suicide. Um, they're also looking at alcohol and drug, drug use. So oftentimes we see in the data that you know um, some of the decedents from suicide had high blood alcohol content levels, and that could be the rationale for our grantees collecting that type of data. It's a quick run through there. So I'm interested um, in hearing from you. We're going to have a quick poll to see what types of data do you collect on suicide deaths or attempts because um, we're trying to see if anybody else out there is collecting anything different to try and show the outcomes in their communities are um, you know, hopefully decreasing as far as suicide, deaths, and attempts. So if anybody could um, go ahead and type into your poll, there's a space where you could type in your answer. What types of data do you collect on suicide, deaths? or attempt. We'll just give a quick minute for that. And if not, um, you can go ahead and um, pull up. We have another poll question right after this. So we see self-harm and hospitalization. That's interesting. And the National Violent Death Reporting System data. That's great. death records and certificates. That's good too. Some people have um, access and they actually have like uh, memorandums of understanding with um, the coroners so that they're able to receive that kind of information um, even if it's de-identified. So that's great. Thank you. Emergency department and inpatient hospital discharge data. That's really great because when you start looking at the healthcare system, that's one of the um, things that they found that people that have died by suicide have reached the hospital system within you know, a certain time frame. So it's a great place to um, look at the, uh, the data there. Home and community. Thank you so much for um, participating with that. The epicenter. Epicenters are great as far as working with them because they really get close with the tribal community. And the BRFIS too, the epicenters also help with the BRFIS. There's also the YRRS, which is the youth resilience skill with the behavioral risk factor surveillance survey that um, collects data from adults. OK, Frank, can we get the second question up? I see the Healthy Youth Survey is also a good place to get data. So the second question, what types of data do you collect related to protective factors for suicide in your community? And we wanted to um, have a, just you know, a brief um, look into this because I noticed with a lot of my grantees weren't collecting um, protective factors. And with all the strength, space, and resilience um, knowledge that we have out there, I'd be interested in hearing um, what others are collecting as far as protective factors for suicide. Um, so if you could go ahead and type in your answer there. We can see 
um, sometimes, you know, people come up with interesting things we can all learn and share from. I was doing this presentation at the American Indian Alaska Native Behavioral Health Conference last um, couple of weeks ago in Tulsa, and one of the ladies in the audience from Alaska, she shared that they collect data on um, seasonal data regarding suicide attempts or deaths, and that was interesting because of, you know, in their geographic region, the seasons had a lot to do with um, the numbers. So that's something interesting I learned, did learn there. So engagement in behavioral health services, that's interesting because that could be a protective factor. Um, that's awesome. Participation in community activities and cultural connectedness, those are so awesome. I'd be really interested in hearing uh, what kind of measures you use for those. Um, participation and cultural connectedness. So New Mexico's version of YRBS, that's great. And I know in New Mexico, I work closely with the Tribal Epicenter here, and they oversample um, schools with Native American um, students or high numbers of Native students. And so they get a good representation um, of data. So, so based most people are collecting what's out there um, already in the standardized assessment. Um, but this one in the middle is, says something different with the participation in community activities. So that's really awesome. Thank you so much for um, taking that time with me. We'll go ahead and go back to the PowerPoint, Frank. Okay, so this next slide talks about some of the challenges that our grantees, um, Garrett Lee Smith grantees have related to data sharing because as we mentioned earlier, um, sometimes it's important to get memorandums of a, agreement or understanding or even just, you know, starting with verbal um, agreements to share data as long as um, both sides are benefiting it and both sides um, put protections in place. So with, among our grantees, these are some of the issues that they come up against when they're trying to um, share data with others. So the issues with privacy is important and also the lack of compatibility between systems. And I believe that when like over half of them said that and it sounds like they're talking about the electronic health system the record systems and so sometimes they want to be able to collect this data straight from their health centers or hospitals but because of the um, you know the different software not being able to speak to one another that becomes an issue also consistency in coding and definitions definitely one community could call it an accident and another one would definitely code it a suicide so that's getting um, at kind, kind of like the language or the lexicon that's used either in the health records or even in um, coding it in the coroner's report. Um, lack of buy-in is hard to get people to understand how important this is. You know, it's still kind of a hard topic to talk about. Um, so 24% of our grantees are still issue, um, dealing with that. User-friendly friendly data reporting. So I guess that speaks to like some of the bigger databases that have um, data on suicide and how can they actually get it to me be meaningful maybe to their um, current location um, or even some of, sometimes the big data sets aren't like teased apart according to American Indian Alaska Native. So they're finding issues with that. Also data reflecting negative on the community. So that's a huge, um, you know, barrier that we need to address, and I think um, doing more culturally sensitive research can address that. You know, we do want to provide protections for our communities so that even though we share this data, that it doesn't look um, negatively on them. And so we also need to be collecting the strengths and the positive um, variables um, to balance that out. Cultural concerns regarding suicide seems to be a challenge regarding data sharing. And that really is a huge challenge. We'll talk more about some of the taboo 
in some communities where they, you know, it's not even um, appropriate to talk about death or suicide. So it shows our grantees are going through a lot of challenges in doing the work. So, and one of the um, issues that came up quite often were that some of the data keepers were unwilling to share data due to privacy, confidentiality, or other concerns. And so we asked the grantees, well, how are they addressing that or looking through their notes? We found that, um, and some of the key informants told us it's very important to meet with the data keepers in person and build those relationships, um, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, shake their hand or break bread with them and really um, show your face versus reaching out to them electronically through emails or phone calls. And they also suggested that you reach out to off-reservation providers um, because there's campuses that are close to um, tribes and there's also the state um, that a lot of the reservations reside within states. And so the states also have um, resources that you can connect with. Um, so reaching out to those people. And then again, partnering with the Regional Tribal Epidemiology Center. I can't stress um, how important that is because they really work closely with the tribes in their region. They're, um, they do the community-based participatory research approach where they're really sensitive in the tribes, um, you know, their, their concerns and requests. Um, another strategy is to create MOUs that set up protections for patient data. So you can um, agree to share data, but as long as you de-identify it, for example, and so that, you know, people um, won't be able to be identified so that's one way that can um, make it easier to set up an agreement. So regarding the challenge of taboos, that came up a lot. Cultural taboos related to talking about and or measuring death and suicide was an issue. For example, one tr tribal nation doesn't believe in counting deaths or how many children they have lost. Um, um, that's just their value in their community and we need to honor that and accept that and see how we can work around uh, those taboos. Another community doesn't believe in talking about people who have passed on. And so when we're talking about um, death data and suicide, those can be really challenging. So um, one of the questions we asked uh, of our grantees was, what, if any, are the cultural barriers to counting suicide deaths in your community? And one of our grantees, um, I like to share this quote because she talked a lot in, in one sentence. She said that stigma in the community, not wanting to talk about suicide, belief that talking about suicide will lead to a suicide, and lack of knowledge about suicide and its prevalence in our population, not willing to see that some deaths labeled as accidents, like overdoses, are actually suicides. So that was, um, just in one sentence, some of the cultural barriers that they deal with in their community. So when we talked about, so what are the strategies we can use? You know, we want to honor the communities in, um, you know, their value system, but we also want to help our grantees be successful in their suicide prevention grants that they're working on. So what we found and what one of the grantees um, or the key informants shared um, said that only collect as much data and information as you need. And so this comes from a person that goes out to um, respond to suicide crises in communities. And she says when, um, you know, she's talking to the family that had just lost a loved one, it's not always appropriate to be, you know, collecting a lot of data or even writing it down right in front of them. So um, just get as much as you need uh, was a strategy she used. And then another um, community engages their elders and youth. So that oftentimes um, out of that comes something positive in their communication. The youth have a lot to offer in suicide prevention um, activities, ideas, um, things we can go off of because these programs are ultimately for um, youth with, regarding Garrett Lee Smith. They're to address um, suicide prevention and youth, so engaging them into this conversation helps. And they come up with some strength-based approaches that is so interesting. Um, they realize um, how to honor their elders, but yet honoring themselves into doing this work. 
incorporating other ways of knowing. You can have observances. You don't always have to have data, like hard data, to prove when um, your community is actually coming around, you know, to more of your events. They're more um, apt to talk about things. So using those other ways of knowing um, is important. I'd be really interested to hear what your ideas are as far as um, addressing taboo. So we have another um, audience poll right now. The last one, what are your ideas for addressing taboo around suicide data? Because we want to, like I said, still honor that it is a taboo in some communities but would like to figure out how um, other communities are addressing that. So we'll just give it a few. If you can type in your answers, um, I'm curious to hear how other communities address taboo. One of um, the local grantees that I've actually um, was able to experience their community, they talk about wellness. So they address taboo in saying, well, you know, we want to, um, we want for people to be healthy, mind, body, and spirit. And so that's their way of addressing taboo by talking about wellness in their community. Um, and how can people, how can we help people be well overall? Um, that was really interesting. And that same community also uh, uses their native language and trying to find the words that their ancestors used because, you know, they, they go back and brainstorm with their elders, like, well, how did you guys talk about this, um, you know, back in the day when, when you guys addressed things as a community or as family? So they talked about um, using their language and the word that since they didn't have a word for suicide, they talked about a person feeling really um, like hopeless or depressed was the kind of English translation to that word. We have somebody that says they, they talk, um, they address taboos by pathways about the circle of life through talking circles. That's great. That really is a way of letting people open up in their own way, right? Because we all have different um, upbringings and also the multi-generational um, approach to things. Like some of the elders have a hard time talking about it where the youth um, say it's no sugar coating with them. They just come out and say things. <laughs> and they, they tell me, why don't you just call it like it is? Um, so that's interesting. That's a great way to address the taboo. Do the Indigenous Youth Club one thing that reminds me of some youth that I was talking to who were doing suicide prevention, um, they were saying, oh, well, we don't live in the boonies anymore. Like our grandparents might think that, but we don't think like that. And that was just really um, interesting how the different generations have um, different ways of addressing things. So let's talk about this middle one. Not talking about suicide can make people with thoughts of suicide feel invisible or ignored. So talking about it helps them feel valued and reconnect with their community. That's really awesome. That does give a platform um, that lets them know it's OK. And when your community does um, get on board and are able to have conversations like that without shying away from it, that really is a big step towards um, community healing. This is, can we see the answers? Frank, are we able to um, show them the answers? I'm reading them out loud. I read all the answers. Relay success stories of other tribal communities that have decreased suicide rate. That's their way of addressing taboo. That's really um, a great way, a great use of data um, and showing, especially like community-specific data is a great way um, to talk about it. All right, thanks. Um, we'll go get, get back to the PowerPoint presentation. And this um, PowerPoint will be made available, and the recording will be archived on the strc.org website. So I'm coming close to my um, at the end of my presentation. So some of the other strategies out of all this data that we had, 
it, um, what jumped out to me the most was this next point, is that using the platform of cultural preservation to make an opening for discussion was really um, awesome to see that um, using, like how can we preserve life and preserve our culture and use that as a way to talk about, you know, decreasing suicide. So that was awesome. This is a quote from a Garrett Lee Smith survey respondent. Suicide surveillance requires communication and is a form of preserving our culture and people. So that's really awesome. That comes with a p compassionate human um, element of, um, you know, yes, we're collecting data, but it's because we want to preserve our culture and our people. Here's another slide um, quote from a key informant that was really important to me as well because we do this work out in the community and sometimes our workers don't get recognized. So our key informant said, this is, a, this is good, noble work that we're doing. It's easy to get discouraged and I get there about once a week. But this is good work and we need to tell our people that are working in the field that their work matters. And that was really awesome. Um, you know, an inspirational to hear uh, one of the, the people that has done this work for so long, that to keep on going and your work really matters. So I really like that quote. Some of the limitations of our study is that we were only able to collect data from 17 tribes. So this data isn't able to be um, generalized to the greater American Indian and Alaska Native population. And so at this point, um, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and keep chatting them into the chat box. We um, will be moving forward right now. And um, if you give me just a second, I have a bio that I'll read for my next presenter. I'm so excited um, to be introducing Lauren Lockhart. She is the currently program manager of the Garrett Lee Smith Grant um, Sickle Bundle Respect Project at American Indian Health and Family Services of Southeastern Michigan. She's also a University of Michigan School of Social Work field instructor. Lauren graduated with a Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology with high honors in 2013 from the University of Michigan Dearborn. In 2014, she earned her MSW degree from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor with a special focus on management of human services and mental health. Her experience is in case management, program coordination, and grant management. Warren has previously worked as a youth assistant program case manager and was the former statewide Michigan Mental Health First Aid Project coordinator. Moreover, Lauren has been a mental health first aid instructor since 2014 and has taught hundreds of individuals in the adult and youth mental health first aid curricula. She's passionate about suicide prevention, mental health education, and health disparities. And I'd like to take this moment and um, turn it over to Lauren Lockhart. She can talk to us about her project. Thank you so much, Doreen. I appreciate the You're introduction. Welcome. And I also want to echo Doreen's thought about taking a moment to honor those that are no longer with us that have um, died from suicide or those loved ones that we have lost uh, to suicide. Um, I think it's very important to recognize that um, whenever I do a presentation. Um, just to echo Doreen's thoughts, just all um, what she said, in that it's so important to recognize that these are individuals, these are youth, children, um, adults elders, things of that nature. So um, I'd like to thank everybody again for joining us today and to just honor those that we have lost uh, to suicide. Okay, so the title of the project is Sacred Bundle, and we were able to get elders from the community to translate it into Ojibwe, which is the language spoken because we are in uh, Three Fires territory here. So the word that starts with the M um, in front is the Ojibwe translation of Sacred Bundle. 
the respect underneath stands for respect, engaging, supporting, protecting, empowering, connecting, and teaching. And so we were awarded here the first grant in 2011, and it really helps us to build the infrastructure of the Sacred Bundle project, as well as developing the Hope and Wellness screen. Um, the Adult Advisory Council, developed by a previous grant, they helped to come up with the name of the suicide screen as the Hope and Wellness screen. And additionally, the Youth Advisory Council, which was uh, created by the Youth by the Sacred Bundle Project, um, led to the addition of the uplifting open-ended wrap-up questions that we will go over um, in an upcoming slide as well. So we have a lot of community engagement from the start of this grant in 2011 to where we are currently in the second grant, uh, which is from 2014 to 2019. So here we have the Hope and Wellness screening documents, what's contained within our Hope and Wellness screen. It is the PHQ-9, which is the patient health questionnaire, and it has been modified to include additional questions specifically around suicide, such, ha such as, has there been a time in the past month when you have ever had serious thoughts about ending your life? And have you ever in your whole life tried to kill yourself or made a suicide attempt? And additionally, the question, have you ever lost anyone to suicide, was recently added because it was recommended um, by a community member. And it helps the screener to have an in-depth discussion um, and build rapport with the youth that they are screening. Um, additionally, we have the craft that we use to screen for substance use within the 10 to 17 year olds, as well as the DAST and Audit, which is a substance use screening tool for adults. We also have the Demographic Survey, which asks about cultural background, gender, sexual orientation, and what county do they reside in in Michigan, because our project is a statewide grant. and so. Uh, while we do hold while we do hold screening events in the Metro Detroit area, um, many people come from all over, so we try to encapsulate that data as well in our survey. And then, as I previously talked about, there are wrap-up questions that end the screen, and it includes resiliency-based questions such as, um, "Who is the person that brings you the most joy or happiness um, in your life?" So here we have the breakdown, further breakdown of the Hope and Wellness screen um, with staff. Usually we tend to gather staff as soon as possible, so it's usually done about a month in advance of a screening event. Um, and so we usually go to powwows and other events, so as soon as we know about an upcoming powwow, we try to gather as many people as possible um, to help us do a screening. And screeners need to be at least safe talk trained in order, in order to do interventions. And so we also allow for people with professional behavioral health backgrounds um, to be screeners. So we definitely talk and interview each potential screener um, to assess if they're ready for the screener role or if they would be a better fit to be a floating volunteer um, around the screening. As you see, it takes um, many people to hold the screening, and so the more hands we have available, um, the better to make things just go uh, as smoothly as possible. Uh, we also have the setup portion here, and so um, we usually do a screener training Usually it's done a few days prior or on site as other people are setting up the tents, tables, and chairs. Um, we've been able to uh, purchase the tents and chairs and other materials through our grant, but some sites actually have helped us and provided us with um, tables and chairs. Um, so that can kind of make it easier for traveling from um, Detroit to say 
two hours away if the chairs and tables are there. So we definitely try to get in um, contact with um, powwow committees or other contact people to assess the resources they have. And if those are available to us, um, we're very thankful and we use those uh, for our screening. Additionally, um, we grow sage here at American Indian Health and we take some of this with us and we make um, do-it-yourself smokeless uh, sage bundles. And so we have found this to be very popular for youth and parents that are waiting. And so we have seashells, little drawstring bags, and the sage. And so we make uh, people can make their own emergency smokeless uh, smudge bundles as well to take with them. Additionally, we have added a means restriction table with gun trigger locks and gun lock boxes as an additional resource. We really wanted to be able to provide people with an immediate way to restrict means, um, especially if um, people are interested, youth are interested in getting the screen they themselves or they may know someone who could benefit from having a, gun, a trigger lock or a gun lock box. And so we give those away. Um, for free, um, we give away the smudge bundles for free, um, any, and we also give out additional resources to all youth who come through the screening as well as having an outreach table. So the process of the screen, um, I want to I want to mention too here that Hope and Wellness screens are open to anyone um, 10 to 24 years old. And they are also open to non-native individuals as well. Um, additionally, so if a youth sees that we're somewhere and we're doing the screening, um, we welcome all youth to come over and we talk to them about what the screening is. Um, if they say they are interested, we sign them in and we introduce them to a screener. Along with this process, the screener um, asks the youth how old they are. Um, of course, because if they are a minor, they will need parents to sign a consent and assent for the youth. Once that has been completed, um, the youth completes the paperwork and the screening begins. And it is done in an interview style um, with the youth in private tents. And I have a picture of that coming up shortly because uh, with the powwow setting, it's a lot going on, and we want to maintain confidentiality, so we bought about four or five, um, what is it, five by five tents that the screener and the youth being screened can come into with a little light, a TV table, and uh, a fan inside, uh, just in case we're outside or it's hot in the area that we're in. And uh, the screener score the screen, and they also have a little cheat sheet, a scoring cheat sheet to help guide them through the screen. Um, but at any point, if the screener thinks that a youth could benefit from additional help, we do have an on-site behavioral health provider um, that can talk to the youth and provide a safety plan, intervention, or whatnot. And I'll be talking more about that in just one slide. Um, additionally, all youth, whether they screen positive or not, are given several resources, including local community health centers numbers, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline number, and the Trevor Project Lifeline, which is the LGBT, LGBTQ2S Lifeline. And also through this process, um, we've also screened individuals that fall outside of the 10 to 24 year old age range. Um, we've had individuals that fall outside that say, man, I really wish I had someone to talk to or wouldn't it be nice if someone cared about me? And so we've sat down with individuals outside the age range because we believe if someone is, is uh, courageous enough and brave enough to even come up and, and say those things, it's upon us to help as much as we can. So um, we do uh, administer the screen to 10 to 24 year olds, but we also have had um, people that are outside that range, rather younger or older, um, that we've also assisted uh, with the screen. So the consent, assent, and IRB process again. So, like I mentioned, if a youth is under 17 or as a minor, excuse me, um, they will need to get a parent and they will sign a consent assent for their youth. 
and um, anybody over 18 can sign for themselves. And it does have standard IRB components, um, such as the benefit and risk, the voluntary nature, um, confidentiality, and contact information. And so the youth are assigned a unique de-identified number. And so that is why the second grant it does not have IRB oversight because all data is de-identified. And so here we have a picture of a hope and wellness screen we conducted last year. As you can see, the blue tents in the background, as well as the red dots on them, those, those uh, show that the tents are occupied. And uh, this is, like I said, at a local powwow, and we tend to hold our screenings um, at powwows. And additionally, all volunteers wear uh, the green Sacred Bundle t-shirts that has our logo on it. And um, so the, the screening goes on for about four hours. Of course, there's more time than about four hours because they're set up, the screener training the actual screen, and then the um, takedown of the materials, as well as a debrief with screeners. We never end a screening without debriefing with our screeners and talking about self-care and just seeing how things went. So I want to throw some numbers at you as well. And I want to mention that in our first grant, um, there were seven overall hope and wellness screening events were conducted with 137 youth and 19.7% were found to be at risk for suicide. So that was the 2011 to 2014 grant. So moving forward from that, our second uh, cycle of funding, um, 10 hope and wellness screens have been conducted so far with 185 youth uh, screened, and 14.1% of youth have been found at risk for suicide and or substance misuse. And additionally, we conduct um, internal hope and wellness screens at the agency. So if a youth wants to drop by, um, they can get administered the hope and wellness screen, as well as our behavioral clinic we have on site administers the PHQ-9 and other forms relevant to if they're a minor or an adult. Um, so we do internal as well as external um, events for our hope and wellness screen. So the behavioral health provider role, um, the behavioral health provider is always a licensed behavioral health person, and we usually have about one or two individuals to serve in that role. So if a screener thinks a youth needs the BH person to do an intervention, safety plan, or what have you, the screener usually sticks out their hand out the tent, and the BH person comes over. They're usually just milling about, seeing how um, the screeners are doing, seeing how parents, guardians, other youth are at the smokeless uh, smudge bundle table, things like that. And uh, usually our screeners just stick a hand out and say, hey, um, I'd like a little bit further guidance with this. And so this BH person can also make a referral to Common Ground, which is a local crisis center that we have a memorandum of, a, of a understanding with. And if consent is given, Common Ground will follow up with the youth within 24 to 48 hours. And Common Ground can refer for mental health services, crisis center, uh, crisis services, and et cetera. And they can also refer, uh, the BH person can refer, again, for developing safety plans, um, traditional healing, and uh, maybe spending more time with family, just really talking with the youth to develop um, something that will keep the youth uh, safe in many different ways. So here are the wrap-up questions that our Youth Advisory Council um, created. Um, the Youth Advisory Council meets every second Tuesday of the month to, di to discuss suicide prevention, substance misuse, and abuse prevention, as well as other topics. And so our youth saw that or we also have a youth program um, called the Dream Seekers. So many youth in our Dream Seekers program are, are a part of our 
um, Youth Advisory Council as well. And so um, the youth gave us feedback, which we readily welcomed throughout our whole project. And they saw how vulnerable a person could be after finishing the Hope and Wellness screen. And they suggested a more positive way to end it with the questions above. And so um, we also hold yearly community readiness assessments with the youth and adult advisory councils around suicide prevention, and they're conducted in a focus group style and discussion. And I wanted to bring up, like, for question one, who is the person that brings you the most joy or happiness in your life? There was a youth that said, my mom brings me the most happiness in my life. And the second question, what are the two things you are most grateful for? One youth said tradition and language. So it's just a way to um, honor that um, courage and vulnerability that youth have by ending with some resiliency and reminding them that they are strong no matter what they're going through and providing resources to them to um, encourage them to go on. Additionally, here are some of the demographics. Um, that we have from our first cycle of funding as well as our second round of uh, funding. Um, so like I said, there were seven hope and wellness screens. Um, many youth identified as being female, as you can see from the graph, as well as being native and or multiracial, um, having a multiracial native background. Um, the, same, the same can be said for the graph on the right for GLS2. Um, the same, many youth identifying as female, as well as being native or um, having a multiracial native um, background. And so uh, we've had an increase in 10 to 13-year-olds getting screened. Um, I don't have a specific reason as to why that is, but I imagine it's um, something to do with we've been coming to certain events or certain powwows um, over the years, and so um, maybe they feel more comfortable coming over. Maybe their friends have done it, and they feel more feel more at ease at coming over. But whatever the reason is, um, we let youth know that we are available um, to do screens, and we also recommend they come to the agency if they are not able to um, at the time that we are there at the powwow. Okay, and going to go through a few more slides before questions here. Um, and so how we collect data is through the Early Identification Referral and Follow-Up Survey, or what we call the Healing Helper Survey. So it's what the screener fills out after, um, after a screening has been done. And so it only ref refers to risk for suicide, and it does not include substance use or misuse. It notes if youth have gotten any referrals, and the EIRF is turned into ICF, an evaluation and data tracking company that works with SAMHSA. Additionally, people that we've trained in Safe Talk or Assist that are known as gatekeepers can also fill out this healing helping survey after identifying a risk that's at youth. And they're given a web link as well as paper copies so they can um, identify that data as well. And I think this is our last slide. Oh, we got like one more here. Uh, we are developing a screening toolkit. We've been doing conducting hope and wellness screens for a few years now, and we want to spread our process to other communities interested in suicide prevention. Um, the toolkit is almost finished, and I suggest that people who are interested in receiving the toolkit send me an email. My contact info will be on the last um, slide, and uh, people can contact me that way so they can receive that. And it, like, it has everything we talked about as listed on this slide and, and more to talk about scaling up and scaling back in case you don't have as many volunteers or um, perhaps do not have access to two BH provider people. We talk about that as well in the toolkit. All right, and so this is my last slide here, acknowledgments. I really like to acknowledge the, the team, the Sacred Bundle team. Um, I like to acknowledge everybody in this slide and more, the community, everybody. Um, it is just great to work with the community. It's really great to have youth involved. 
um, it's really great to get to continue to get feedback. You know, this is not something where we've taken it just once in our grant cycle and said thanks for the input. We are constantly um, asking people, you know, how can we improve? What are things you like? What are things you like to see us doing? And so I'm very thankful for the team and everybody that's participated um, in the work we do and the youth that have um, participated um, in the questions and the screenings and whatnot. And uh, this is my contact information as well as Doreen's. And that is our Facebook website as well at the bottom, as well as our logo to the right. And I'd like to say chi miigwech to everybody who joined us today. Hey, Lauren. Thank you so much. And um, on the right-hand side, we have thank you, miigwech. And we say naifja in our language, which is called karis um, for my tribe. So. Nice to everyone for attending our webinar. If you have any questions, you can go ahead and um, type them in to the chat box on the left-hand side. And we just have a few minutes to um, entertain questions and answers from either Lauren or I. I really like what you did, Lauren, with um, changing the name of the EIRF because I've only ever heard it as EIRF, and now he hearing the Healing Helper Survey, that's so awesome. This just kind of um, gives it a different feel and a context to, you know, a data collection form, which, which they're all tasked to do. It's really awesome. So, thank you. And we call everybody that is a part of our process Healing Helpers. Um, and so we thought it was only right to continue that, especially with the EIRF. It's a little bit chunky to say, and it is a long acronym. And so um, as you see on our Facebook link here, um, we call people healing helpers because we're all healing helpers, and, and all sacred bundles are um, important and precious to us. So um, I think it's gone, gone over pretty well. Okay, great. And um yeah, if you have any questions, go ahead and put it into the chat box on the left-hand side. And I also wanted to mention that EIRF does stand for Early Identification Referral Form. So that's a form that our grantees are required to fill out when they make um, these connections and do screenings out in the community. So that's a great way to make it more, um, you know, appropriate for your own um, area there. So awesome. Thank you so much for everyone that joined. We want to say hi to everyone at American Indian Health and Family Services from NISA. <laughs> NISA. And also, um, yeah, say hi to my friends and family that joined. I wasn't able to see who all joined. And um, excuse us for the couple minutes of technical difficulties as most webinars have. But I am really enjoyed um, co-presenting with you, Lauren. So thank you, everyone, for attending. Send us any questions. You have our emails right there. And um, look forward to a recorded archive of this event on the sprc.org website in the future. And I'll go ahead and respond to people that are sending me emails on um, their email addresses. And